Okay, Rabotai. So I want to start a, a, uh, a series, I don't know how long we'll make it, about the, the, the system of Bate Dinim, particularly in Morocco. Now, in the year 1918, everything changed. What happened before 1918? The Jewish community basically was in charge of their own, uh, of their own finances, of their own uh, enforcement. I mean, they worked with the law, more or less. But the Batedinim were, were, were solely the responsibility of the community. And the community, I mean, there was the Rabbanim, and there was the Parnaseair, and there was the people who took care of the city. And they appointed a Dayan, and that Dayan appointed another few Dayanim, and that's how it, and that's how it, and that's how it worked. What happened was, in 1918, was that the French protectorate came to uh, Morocco, already from 1912, already 1913, and they, um, they basically came in with a, with, uh, with part of their agenda to, to um, improve all types of judicial systems, and that meant also by the Jews. Now, were the Rabbanim happy about this or not? So I'll tell you, in general, I have a speech given that I read from Rav Vidal in 1917, that he gave a speech in Fez, how he was happy and he was praising the, the, the French uh, protectorate from coming in, because they are going to add on a lot of order and a lot of uh, and, a, and a lot of uh, professionalism. Now, it's not. I'm not sure if he was saying that because he was saying it in public and he had to speak. But then I found that Rabbi and Kawa, the Toafot Re'em, the first, uh, the chief rabbi of Morocco, 1918. Uh, well, he wasn't the first. It was him and Rabbi Shlomo Ibn Dinan, and he mentions how he was praising the French protectorate because they brought in cleanliness, cleanliness in the streets, the streets were dirty, plus medical, plus medical aid. So on that he was very happy. And one of the things that they did was that they made a bunch of um, rules and structure to the existing Bet Din. They, give, they gave full force to the Bet Din, whatever had to do with marriage laws, anything that had to do with inheritance. Uh, till today that's how it works. They didn't give them full reign in monetary law, though. They didn't give them full reign in monetary law. Uh, they also made them record many things that are not necessarily always according to halakha, but it's, it just adds on more sense of, uh, of, uh, of achrayut and responsibility. They added on um, that the, that, that, that the, the, uh, the every, there, there's a number to every single case, the person has to have his full name and his job put in there. It has to be done on, on official paper. As a matter of fact, last week, uh, my friend Nadav Yitzchaki uh, bought in an auction a few, a few, uh, a few documents of the Beddin in Morocco. And he gave it to me over here. I have it right over here. That it is original documents of the Beddin of 1922. Signed in because this is uh, this is the Bedin in Casablanca in 1922. How do you know it's 1922? Because if you lift it up in the in the sun, I don't know if you could see this in the light. You could see that it's it's written the uh, it's written in the background. The stamp says 1922, so it's official notarized paper. If you take a look, it's official notarized paper. There's the number. There's the stamp. That means it's notarized, and it was signed over here by the Dayanim Rabbi Avram Abu Chatzera, Rabbi Avram Yifrach. Rabbi David Dahan, and they were and they were um, basically uh, dealing with a certain uh, woman who uh, who was coming from uh, Tangier, and this was this this was the diun then 1924. This diun was the year five six eight four, uh, number two thirty eight. Original document is going to be part of our Maganavot Museum over here, Rabotai. We have the museum section right over there. It's going to be part of our museum. Another document, another document we have over here. Mike, look at this one. It's the year 1951. You can tell by the stamp in the back. It says République Française in the back. It's the official thing, République Française. And it's signed by Rabbi Makhlouf Abu Khatsera, who was the Avbedin of Marrakesh. 
He was the, uh, from the Avbedin of Marrakesh. And this was also, you can tell that there was a stamp, an official notarized stamp. These are original documents. And this is how they did the Bedi in Morocco. They, they added in, I brought down in my book that I'm writing on Chosh and Mishpat. They brought down at least, at least 30 or 40 different rules that they added on. Part of them being that beforehand in Morocco, one Dayan was able to decide on certain things. It was a, it was a, it was a, even though you're usually supposed to have three Dayanim. It's, it's, it's French or is it in, uh, in No, it's Lashona Kodesh. Lashona Kodesh. For, it used to be that one Dayan was able to decide on things. And even though you're supposed to have three Dayanim, but if the litigants accept in the first place that it could be one Dayan, it's fine. But the French protector changed that and said, no, you have to have three, no matter what. <coughs> and anybody has whatever partial connection to the litigants, he has to recluse himself from the case, which is also a halakha. But what happened was, was that if, if the litigants accepted upon themselves, it's called that kiblu alayhu, it might be a lot of certain circumstances, the French didn't allow it at all. And I think they probably worked with certain rabbanim to make all these rules, but it was, it was, it was under a strict jur jurisdiction. So in some ways it was good, and in other ways it was a little bit, uh, we'll call it, it was a little bit over the top, because the rabbanim had a way how to, how to run things, but autonomy was fully given. Autonomy was fully given that, that enforceability was according to Jewish law. There was no secular law that came into this whatsoever. It was totally Jewish law. But at the same time, even though it was Jewish law, it was something that, that, there, was, that there was rules that were given, general rules. So one of them was that you have to have three. Another one, that, 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 as I mentioned, that, that the names have to be put in their full and their jobs. So now that I'm going through the Bedina Fez of the 1920s, I'll tell you that their jobs it was, it was very interesting. In other words, most ladies worked, that's for sure. And they all, a lot of them worked in something, which, which is that they would make buttons for the kaftans. That was a lot of time their work. Other, others were, were, uh, were, um, were, were storekeepers, but uh, others were blacksmiths. Others were, you know, coppersmiths. Others, others, and others were, um, they, once in a while, you found people who were avrechim. Lamdan, it was called. This person's a lamdan. He sits and learns. And they had special benefits in the community. They, Talmidei Chachamim, even though they had a side gig, I, we spoke about this in the past, they weren't taxed. No taxes to them. You're not, you're not allowed to tax any Talmidei Chachamim whatsoever. And, and, uh, and, and once in a while, there was a case that came to them because they were given the job of being an apotropos, which is being in charge of properties of orphans or being in charge of properties of the, the Bet Knesset. So another, another rule that they had was that it had to be all notarized, as I mentioned. It had to be something that was, um, that, that was only in these laws, which was of Yerusha, which is of, of, um, of, uh, of an inheritance, anything to do with Gitin, Kiddushin, anything marital, anything to do with marital laws, anything to do with Shalom Bait, which a lot of these cases were Shalom Bait. This is just an introduction. Bezat Hashem, next time we'll speak a little bit more about these Batidinim and the Takanot that were before 1918 and the Takanot that were afterwards. Chazaku Baruch.